Hello, my name is Imad Lilo. I'm uh, um, the Practice Improvement and Development Lead for Mercy Care NHS Trust. I'm also an honorary lecturer uh, for John Moores University. Today I'll be talking about recent changes to policy and legislation governing mental health and I'll be looking at have we really made any uh, progress. Uh, hi, my name is Anna Cimento. I work at the University of Liverpool um, and this is... Uh, I'm Carl Dutton. Uh, I work for Old Hay Children's Hospital working in the uh, CAM service. Um, and today we're going to be presenting on a Haven of Green Space which is a therapeutic horticultural intervention um, exploring both the intervention delivery uh, and uh, attached evaluation. Hello, my name is Jill Pendleton um, and I have um, two jobs at the moment. I'm working for Mercy Care as the dementia lead and I'm also the project manager for Innovate Dementia, which is a European project working with Liverpool John Moores and Mercy Care. Hi, good morning. Um, shall we get started? Um, welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this um, research seminar today. Obviously it's a series of seminars and the <coughs> we'll mention when the, the next seminar will be. We've got some um, very interesting speakers doing different types of research as well which is quite exciting. Um, just to mention that my name is um, Graham Smith and I'm the head, well at the moment I'm the head of social work, mental health and counselling and psychotherapy. I'm also part of the Innovate Dementia <coughs> research team and Jill Pendleton will be talking about that project later on so I thought I'd mention that because you'll unfortunately you'll see my face on the DVD and I'm also head of Centre for Collaborative Innovation in Dementia which was launched um, yesterday so um, lots of exciting things around around that area. Um, with no more ado shall we get started so our first speaker is Emad. Oh, thanks. Okay um, do I have 20 minutes? Minutes, All yeah. right, well, it's a, it's a big task. Um, right, um, I'll be very brief um, um, because there's a lot of um, things to um, address. Um, so hopefully at the end we'll have opportunity for question and answer session. Um, I've done a research but I'm not going to go over the research around um, the impact of the amendments to the Mental Health Act on BME service users and I've, I've been commissioned by the Department of Health three years ago and the finding of that research was published but as I said I'm not going to go over this for this presentation. Mental health as we know um, it's a major issue in this country 25% of uh, um, health diseases attributed to, attributed to um, mental disorder in comparison to 16% for example for cancer, equally 16% for heart diseases. So um, this coalition government take it very, very seriously and it's enshrined in their strategy, i.e. new horizons and uh, no um, health without mental health. But as we can see um, later on, there is a huge gap between the ambitious policies of the government and what's happening really in practice. Um, um, I'll just go about, go back maybe over the last 30 years, take you back and just um, go over the milestones that led to um, the current legislation we have. Um, taking you back to 1983. 1983 was an excellent piece of legislation, arguably, um, because it was enshrined about rights, safeguards for um, uh, people with mental health problems, their carers, um, families. Having said that, because of high profile homicides, um, i.e., uh, Christopher Clunas, uh, the man who killed uh, Jonathan Zito, uh, followed by Michael Stone, uh, the man who um, allegedly, and I'm, I'm emphasizing allegedly because he's still appealing, allegedly killing um, Lynn Russell and her daughter Megan and um, the other daughter Jody, Josie, I think, who survived, um, followed by the 
a pathetic incident, um, a few, some of us recall um, Ben Sulcock, the man who uh, jumped into the lion den in London, in, in London Zoo. At the time, it was back in 19, in the beginning of the 90s, I lived almost um, not far from London Zoo. My concern at the time was the lion all right. <laughs> you know, the lion was all right. Unfortunately, Van Selkirk was, was badly hurt, but survived. So as a result of, uh, of those incidents, um, the thinking changed overnight from rights to risk, risk, risk. Of course, there are connections between mental disorder, policy, um, and the media. Um, we do have relatively fascist media. And um, arguably, people with mental health problems, I put them on the par with refused asylum seekers. Are they unwanted people? And very much the policies of today are enshrined by that. It's born out of fear, stigma, risk, risk, risk. But I'll start by introducing you to the purpose of mental health legislation. Well, the main purpose is to allow compulsory action to be taken where necessary to make sure that people with mental disorders get the care and treatment they need for their own health or safety or for the protection of other people. It sets out the criteria that must be met before compulsory measures can be taken along with the protections and safeguards for patients. It's basically to ensure that we follow a procedure prescribed by law, Article 5.4 of the Human Rights Act. Okay? It should not be taken lightly. Um, for example, if I, was commit, if I was to commit an offence, which is very unlikely because I often go late at night to ASDA and I start consuming some of the products, right? got away with it. In fact, I didn't. A few years ago, um, I was down the um, Tesco Metro um, near where I lived, and I had one of the drinks, and I proceeded to, the, to, to pay, and I put my hands in my pocket. There was no money. Thank God they knew me, so, so go home and get the money and come back. But anyway, if I was to be picked up, by, and that's, that's the truth, if I was to be picked up for an offense, I will be taken to a police station, I will be interviewed, I will have legal representation, then the case will be considered by the Crown uh, Prosecution Service, so they're going to refer it to the, some court, whether it's what type of court, magistrate, Crown Court, it depends on the offence, and I will have legal representation, yeah? And if I was to get to a total centre and go through a protracted long process, having said that, to section somebody, yeah, to deprive somebody of their liberty and their mental health, it's only take somebody like me, because I am an amp, I make the application of the Mental Health Act, and two doctors, and it can happen over an hour. So it's a serious matter. The other piece of legislation that's very, very important, and I've been advocating for that, those amongst us today, practitioners, educators, we really need to really look at this piece of legislation closely. Because I do love this piece of legislation at last, uh, there is something done for um, the most vulnerable people, one of the most vulnerable in our society, those who, who lack capacity, um, you know, and making certain decisions um, at certain times. So the Mental Capacity <laughs> Act um, is to ensure that our practice, our approach, our interventions are appropriate and legal. But there is widespread misunderstanding of um, of that piece of legislation as well as um, its application. Um, here we are. As I said earlier, 1983, the 80s, beginning of the 80s, arguably is a good period, you know, about rights and civil liberties for people with mental health problems. But overnight that changed and um, risk seem to be prevailing. And as a result, um, it has impact. Because back in 1998, the New Labour, um, one of its initiatives to reform the mental health uh, legislation, and for six years they were trying their hardest. 
and they're almost going to introduce a new mental health act in 2004 or 2005. But hey, they stopped because the reality of it, um, it costs a lot of money, There's a lot of rights. So what they've done instead, in 2006, they've decided, okay, we'll keep the 1983 Act, yeah, we will amend it, massage it a little bit, yeah, make it a human right compliant, okay, and introduce some of punitive measures, yeah. And as a result, we had the uh, 2007 Mental Health Act, which was introduced in, which was introduced in November 2008. It's an amendment act. Okay. Um, nine amendments, and including the 10th around deprivation of liberty, definition of mental disorder, changes around definition of mental disorder, criteria for detention and professional roles, nearest relative, community treatment order, tribunals, age-appropriate services, advocacy, ECT, fantastic. Look, most of them have not made change, hardly made any change to service users, the carers of the families. I know I've seen some of the people here are practitioners and I hope they, they, they share their experience. Hardly any change being made to the outcomes, their experiences, uh, but really the significant changes are our community treatment order. Community treatment order is basically um, compulsion in the community. What I mean by that, we can't uh, compulsory treat people in the community, but what happened is that once you place somebody on a community treatment order, it's like an indefinite sentence. The latest reports um, findings that only 20% of people who put in community treatment end up discharged from it. So the majority remain. Clinicians argue if somebody, if we put somebody on a community treatment order, if they're doing fantastic, well, we don't need to take them off it. If they are not, they say we need to keep them on it. So it's, it's like being on a, in a lobster pot. Once you're in it, baby, it's going to be very hard to get you out. Yeah? I call it the psychiatric asbo. Believe me, I'd rather be on a community order than being on a, on a, on a what you call supervised community treatment order. And very much, this has reinforced the medical paternalism, that patient-doctor um, relationship. It, 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 we have not been able to move on and progress in that area, unfortunately. So. I was one of uh, those who was consulted before the amendments uh, introduced and I shared some of my concern, danger of overuse, um, over-reliance on drug treatment, damaging to therapeutic relationships, and that might be sort of a cartoon of funny sort of, but that is the reality. Once we put somebody in a community treatment order, we can, put a, we can just put them on any condition we like. We can say to them, well, look, we can put them on a curfew order and expect them to be at home from 8 p.m. till 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. We can specify the number of alcohol units to take, drugs. We can, we can basically specify the places where they go to. As long as they cooperate and agree, we can go ahead with the, with the, with the, with, with, with the order. If they stop complying, we have the power of recall them back to hospital and they go back on a section three. Okay? I know I'm going fast and I might be losing some of you, it's just because of the time constraints. So, what are the latest findings? It's basically our concerns became, well, has become reality. Nine, well, the number of detention rose nine to 11 percent. The largest increase in the use of police detention, section 136, rose to 135 percent. You know, um, in fact, latest research that 80% of all Section 136 is inappropriate. Um, and our affairs become reality in relation to um, um, community treatment order. The government were expecting, the Department of Health expecting, well, every year we get 500. The first five months of its implementation, we had in total over 2,000 people 
on a community TV to order. So it's, 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 it's has really well exceeded all expectation. Again, that was captured in my research, the last one, in relation to uh, people from BME background. Up to 38% of detained patients are from BME background. In fact, um, approximately 35% of patients on uh, committee treatment order from BME background. Um, let's look at the um, recent research, for example, around this area. Well, the ink has not dried. This is the finding of a, a recent um, research uh, published in, uh, in, in, in April about the use of, um, of CTO and basically there is such a setting, there is no evidence that is going to reduce the rate of readmission. They've introduced CTO basically to address what you call revolving door patient, um, closer monitoring in the community, um, support, but we know the reality. With the cuts we've seen, severe cuts over the last <coughs> few years, you know, services are stretched, shortages of practitioners, which I will go over later on. But, you know, um, my colleagues, the Amazon social work has been a bit disappointing, and I'm sorry to say that, because they have rubber stamped most of uh, CTO recommendations. It is time we basically think differently. And I know some of the sort of my colleagues, social workers, are here. And we need to really look at the ethics and effectiveness of CTO before actually agreeing to this very, very punitive um, piece of legislation. Oh, let's look at what the uh, Care Equality Commission is now saying. Basically, the NHS watchdog in relation to uh, um, the use of the Mental Health Act. So what they're saying to us, there is a significant gap between the realities observed in practice and the ambitions of the national mental health policy. No health without mental health, as I said earlier. Services are under pressure. Example, AMPS. Nationally, there's a, there's a, there's a big, huge shortage of AMPS. Locally, we've addressed this, um, uh, particularly in Liverpool, we have sufficient AMPS service, but that is not replicated nationally. Uh, transport to hospital, I was talking to Harry earlier, uh, he's a practitioner like me and he has concerns, um, lack of beds, uh, he told me earlier, um, in fact he shared with me a case, he said uh, uh, when we completed the assessment and we needed to transport the patient to, ho uh, to hospital, we found the ambulance service, the ambulance service would not turn up and the only mean of, of transport was the uh, the, um, the uh, police um, um, uh, vehicle and the patient was told, you know, he has to uh, go into that little uh, box at the back of the van. Is that right, Harry? Is that what you said to me? Only 15, 20 minutes ago. And this is quite common. Access to psychological therapies is very limited and uh, disjointed. Concern that cultures of control and containment are priorities over treatment and support. Example, de facto det detention of voluntary patients. Over the last five to six years, it's not, not only has been an increase in, 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 in the detention, there's been an increase in inpatient population, about 20% increase. And some of those, they're uh, voluntary, yeah? But um, what I call them, de facto detained. How much time? Five minutes, yeah. I've been talking really fast, tried my best, yeah. Um, to be honest with you, if I was an impatient, maybe for a medium to long term, I'd rather be on a section than being voluntary. Because if I'm a voluntary patient, I want to leave, yeah? Yeah? They could stop me from leaving for a number of reasons, maybe. Often because of shorter staff, they need to be escorted, yeah? And if I'm a voluntary patient, I don't have any rights. Yeah, I have no rights. Whereas if I was on a, on, on a section two or three, I have rights for tribunal. Yeah, if I section, section three, I'll have rights for aftercare. <coughs> I will have uh, rights um, if I'm agreeing with the medication for a, a second opinion of both doctor to, to, to review my, 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 my medication and authorize it if necessary. Um, I have rights for my, my, my nearest relative to discharge me. Yeah, section 23 of the Mental Health Act. Yeah. Um, voluntary patients have none of the above rights. 
So here we go. Um, so, and this is, has become reality. When the 2007 Act given royal assent, and I, and I remember that very, very uh, clearly, I looked up the, um, at the time, the Mental Health uh, Alliance website, and they had that statement. The end result is that the Mental Health Act remains profoundly stigmatizing overall. The 2007 Mental Health Act will go down in history as a missed opportunity, while other countries, often with less well-developed mental health services, are fundamentally modernizing their mental health laws, our already outdated law has at best been mildly improved. So, it is and will go down in history as a missed opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for that email. That was um, very interesting. As a mental health practitioner, I kind of um, understand some of the things you were saying, and I do agree about the de facto detention, certainly around the increase of institutionalisation, like locked doors, for example, <coughs> mental health units, which are uh, a very serious concern as far as I'm concerned in relation to, to, to voluntary patients. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of questions, we have the opportunity at the end to ask um, the four presenters <clears throat> some some questions. So shall we move on to to um, the, the next presenters? And it's Anna and Carl. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, we'll just do a quick introduction. My name's Anna Cimento, I work at Liverpool University um, and I'm a research assistant. Um, and Hi, my name's Carl Dutton, I'm a, a clinician. Um, I've had 25 years experience working in the NHS, last 15 with children and young people. Previously, the, the 10 years was with adults with mental health problems, so <laughs> link, I'll link with you there. Okay, and today we're going to talk about uh, the use of therapeutic horticulture um, in schools to help address uh, children's mental well-being. Okay, so uh, just a bit, of, a bit of background about the Haven of Green Space. This is um, an intervention that we've developed over a, uh, a number of years uh, in uh, particular schools in Liverpool. Um, pre previous to the Haven of Green Space, there was a group called the Life Group, which was uh, purely a group for refugee and asylum-seeking children. Uh, this was part of a project called the Haven Project, um, and following the, um, the, sort of the life group, we, we asked the young people, well, what, we, what would you like? And actually the young refugees said, actually we don't want to be on our own, we actually want to be with other young people from other cultures and other backgrounds. Um, so uh, we developed um, the Haven of Green Space. Um, initially the, the group used, as you can see, horticulture, art, psychotherapy, storytelling and psychodrama and one of the reasons that we use those interventions is actually they don't rely on words mostly. They do a little bit um, and in terms of storytelling, well stories cross cultures. You know, when I was thinking about one of the stories that, um, that crosses cultures is actually Cinderella. It's actually, it's known uh, throughout the world. So we, we here in the, the UK will know it in a particular way uh, when I was working with some Somali young people, they said, well, actually, the wicked stepmother, she normally has ass's ears. So it's, it's known throughout the world. So if you can use uh, stories with young people, uh, you can sometimes get the message across. Okay, um, so we sought to build on the experiences that the Haven Project had had with the Life Group. Um, and there was a, a call for funding, conveniently came up from the Liverpool PCT under the Natural Choices for Health and Wellbeing. Um, and this is something that we went for to uh, look to run a pilot intervention, basically, based on the green space model, slightly adapted. Um, so we did very much just concentrate on horticulture. And that um, 
my role was in uh, developing and conducting a systematic evaluation to try um, and in particular look at uh, the impact of the environment of, as a drill driver for improvements in health and well-being. Um, the last point at the bottom there, the five ways to well-being, uh, this is something that Liverpool PCT obviously are promoting, um, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but it includes the five ways are to connect, take notice, be active, give and keep learning. Um, it's an evidence-based framework that was developed by the New Economics Foundation um, as a driver of improvements in, in health and well-being in particular. Okay, okay so... In, ter in terms of the therapeutic model, I guess uh, the first thing to say is actually participatory really should be at the top. When I was looking, when I was looking at this, I think positive participatory is the main thrust of this because the young people drive the sessions. Um, so we don't set the agenda with them. Um, they have um, free reign of uh, the green spaces that, that we have on offer uh, in both the schools that we've uh, been researching. Um, and that, that can be a little bit hairy both for, for us as practitioners because you're allowing them to carry uh, loppers and shears and spades and forks etc and sometimes that might mean that they might be whizzing them round the head and that's, that is about risk and the management of risk is not to immediately jump in and say don't do that but actually just be mindful of what they're doing uh, so they set the agenda so some of them will want to do digging and planting but others will want to just dig a hole and create a story so they might be wanting to dig to Australia or they want to be digging for buried treasure um, so we take those opportunities when they start to do that to, to either develop the story or to work alongside them to find out exactly what uh, exactly what they're what they're thinking or they're feeling at the time the other aspect is horticulture gives you a great chance to use the metaphors that are available. So we have life and death on a, on a daily basis in a garden or in a, in a green space. So there are opportunities to talk about those those moments. Uh, there's uh, the seasons. It can be both wonderfully dry occasionally, uh, but mostly wet and cold. So we have opportunities to to look at to look at the feelings associated with that feeling happy and feeling miserable when it's wet, uh, wet and damp, and things like. Um, having weeds. Now weeds, I think, they've got a place in life, okay, but actually if, uh, if you allow them to grow too much, they're going to choke other stuff off. So you can use the metaphors of weeds, of the, of the plants that they, they've got, uh, um, in terms of uh, the sort of spiritual aspect, there's something about, there's, there's something bigger than us, me and you, that actually in this space we're doing something a bit bigger than just between us. Okay, so um, obviously the aim of this was to apply some lessons from the life group. So uh, there were certain things that were incorporated, such as the frequency of the intervention sessions and ensuring there was a lot more kind of active communication between uh, the intervention model itself and, uh, and schools. Um, the overall aim of uh, the intervention was to support young children and young people's emotional well-being needs through group horticultural psychotherapy. Um, so, as Carl has mentioned, uh, one of the big suggestions that came out of the Life Group was actually extending this to population groups outside of refugees and asylum seekers. So we sought to work with all children experiencing social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Um, the Life Group was also, as you saw on the first slide, just a targeted intervention for secondary schools and a haven of green space extended that to primary and secondary. Um, we targeted uh, sort of pupils with similar um, eight levels of maturity and emotional literacy, so uh, in the primary school years five and six and in the secondary schools years seven to nine. It also meant that we could capture that transition between primary to secondary school, which for a lot of young people is often quite a difficult transition for them to make. The um, referrals for the intervention were, were agreed internally by schools and then provided to us through a pen profile, so a very de brief description of the child themselves, their context, including their family context. Um, and as again Carl has mentioned, this did include a risk assessment so that we could understand any potential risks with, with having various pieces of equipment in the, in the garden space. Um, and a key thing was that we wanted to explore the use of this intervention as an early intervention preventative approach as opposed to uh, 
it replacing any more uh, in-depth forms of uh, specific mental health support for uh, particular needs. Um, so the evaluation itself uh, was designed uh, with some input from uh, specialist participatory action researchers and public health um, who had a particular interest in uh, looking at this connection between the environment as a driver to improvements in mental well-being. Um, there were four main areas really that the evaluation sought to explore and that was the impact of the intervention obviously upon the mental well-being of the children and young people um, and then any concomitant impacts upon physical health. Um, it was also to explore the practical challenges from a practitioner and uh, the school's perspective uh, with a view to our aim was to see if this intervention could be replicated and Im implemented uh, much more widely. So we needed to think about those practical challenges um, and also to think about the teacher and school's understanding of the benefits of um, interaction with green space for well-being very broadly. Um, for the purpose of what we're going to talk about today, the two key bits there that are in italics, I'm not actually going to pick up on. Um, all the rest of them I'm going to try and give you a very whirlwind tour of. Um, ethics, we, as a service evaluation, we had ethical oversight from Older Hay Research and Development who um, approved the study protocol. Um, we um, also had informed consent of parents or guardians and uh, in, in some cases... Um, you'll see some of the young uh, people were refugees and asylum seekers, as well as from families whose literacy levels were very poor. So we actually, in the place of written consent, in certain cases accepted verbal consent. Um, and we also included, uh, in line with the participatory approach of the entire intervention, uh, informed assent of the children and young people. So when we first met them, we said to them, can you sign up to being involved in this intervention and to taking part in the evaluation and giving us your feedback? So we handed very much the onus of taking responsibility for what they were getting involved in to themselves um, and, and sort of kept reinforcing the fact that they were the experts on how well this intervention model works for their emotional and mental well-being needs, not us, and we needed to learn from them. Um, one of the other things that we're actually going to do whilst we're going through the rest of this presentation is to kind of critically assess each of the evaluation tools for their utility. Um, obviously, you can see there was a lot that went in there. Some of them work really well. Some of them we have reservations about and, uh, um, and obviously need f further development. So I'm going to try and pick up on that. Okay, so one of the key things was to integrate the evaluation tools into the session delivery rather than having them as an add-on. And again, this is to do with the ethical responsibility not to overburden children and young people, as well as not to um, overburden teachers and therapists. Teachers in particular, their time is pretty precious, so we really wanted to find ways of collecting information from them uh, that, was, uh, that matched other things that they were doing. So a few that I've... Um, Highlighted here is the draw and write journals, which were completed at each session with very minimal instruction of sort of, this is your space to document uh, your thoughts and feelings about the group and the group sessions. Um, so very, very broad, not focusing in particular on mental well-being or emotional well-being. Obviously, our understanding of what that means and perhaps a young person's understanding are going to be slightly different. So we just wanted to be very free and very open. It's a slight departure from the draw and write methodology normally, which is much more directive, but actually it worked very well for us. Um, and the use of it... it we had available at each session were cameras to take photographs, as well as pens, pencils, other bits of art materials. Um, and as Carl has said, in each session, it wasn't necessarily that we sat them down and said, right, you know, now you're doing your journals, although there was a bit of time at the end of each session to do that. But they could come in and pick them up and take them and use them whenever they felt they wanted to document something. Um, the second one, the reflective uh, session diary, it, it became a diary once it was transcribed, so actually they had discussions um, into a dictaphone which were sent to me and I had the joy of transcribing into uh, the diaries. But actually this turned out to be really beneficial for some of the other um, evaluation tools that we use because I remained engaged with what was going on in the actual sessions themselves uh, and it meant that any questionnaires or focus group discussions or one-to-one -one interviews that I had with teachers, I could be using the information that I was getting there and making sure I was asking the right questions. 
Um, and lastly, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, the SDQs at the end there. Um, the schools actually use those routinely as a collection tool, any, uh, a data collection tool anyway, so it was serving two purposes at once, which obviously increased the likelihood of their, their completion. I'm not sure if you want to say anything about how well... I mean, what I can say um, is that the kids like to do the journal, they like taking photographs, and I think photographs are a really good ev evidence of change because it's around how they perceive change. So initially, they might start using the photographs and only take pictures of their, their friends constantly, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures of people's faces. But as they got engaged with the activities, so their photographs changed, and so it became a wider picture of, of the environment with which they're in. So I think if there's anybody out there who, who'd like to do a bit of research around the use of photography as evidence, that would be great if there's anybody out there. Uh, because I think, I think there's something around perceptions and how people see things, uh, which is really, really important. I think about the other thing about re reflective diaries is that um, now that um, we're not using the dictaphone, we're actually writing them down, if you're going to use a reflective diary, do it within the day, because if you do it the next day, you'll have forgotten it or you'll have gone on to the next task in your work. Uh, so do it on the day. And, you know, that's from somebody who sometimes does forget uh, to, to do it. Um, I think one very last small point to pick up on is, obviously, we were using this as a pilot intervention. And as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to think about how we could replicate this intervention in other settings. And therefore, there was no point in designing an evaluation and using tools that could not be integrated into a delivery because mm. most projects don't have the dedicated time like I, you know, I was providing to this project and we actually had a full-time um, psychiatrist research trainee as well with us who worked full-time on this project for four months. So we had a lot of resources that we could put into this. Um, actually, the intervention that's being delivered now and, and the one that Carl's writing down doesn't have that additional input. So it was very much about what tools are effective that we can use going forward that are not going to overburden the people involved. Um, is, that, is that me? Yeah, I think, I think you said we were going to move on from that one. <laughs> it's very, no, no, a very no, no. quick slide that gives you an overview <laughs> of the children that were referred in for each school. Um, the numbers uh, at the edge show that, that each group started out with 12 young people um, and by the end yeah. there were between 10 and 11 yeah. um, and overall we had between 7 and 12 yeah. pupils attend each session. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the thing you can see is that actually in terms of dropout rate um, it was a low dropout rate. Now um, I've been a group therapist for a long, long time and in, historically you'd expect between 40 to 50 percent to drop out. Um, obviously, obviously, you can see that that's not the case. And also, it was voluntary. It, there, there was, they didn't have to come if they didn't want to. So uh, there's obviously there's an attraction there uh, for, for, for the young people. Um, so I guess in, ter in terms of uh, sort of themes, uh, you can see that uh, there, are, um, there are lots of uh, themes there. But I'm going to pick up what, where a couple. One is, what is around conflict. Well, when you, when you have a group of new people, you always have conflict. Um, invariably because people are jostling for position, jostling for space. If you think about the, the garden space, it's about territory. So people want to mark their territory and they'll either invite them in or they won't invite them or they'll invade the space and want to fight for the space. So there's, there's, often, there's, there's often a bit of conflict. And one of the ways that we managed that was that we had a tea ceremony. So um, not only do we grow stuff, but we usually eat the stuff as well um, that, that they produce. Um, and so we had a tea ceremony around conflict, and that was around peace building and peacemaking, because there was a real conflict between uh, local children and incomers, okay, or, or, or new arrivals. Um, and there's a real tension, and we, we were thinking long and hard, and we said, I, you know, I think we should go for a tea ceremony. Um, and actually, it was a great, great leveller, because once we did it, um, the kids went out and they got mint from the garden, they discovered mint. Lavender, that's not such a great tea, I have to say, but we went for it, uh, and nasturtiums, which is, 
it's all right-ish. Um, uh, but once they came together, then they started to talk about, well, what did tea mean for their different cultures? And when, once they started to talk about it, so there were some Afghani young people, uh, Pakistani young people, local Liverpool kids, and actually it made them come together and start to talk about, well, what does that mean to us? And then we looked at about the conflict and about what was going on between them as a group. Um, I guess the other thing is, is about when, when, you're, when you're in the space, you start to develop confidence, and the confidence is also around expanding yourself so, uh, to areas that you might not go into in the garden, um, so that you can um, move from one place to another. Rather than just stay in your own little space, uh, you can start to move around the space. Um, and I guess the other bit I'm just going to point out, and I, I, don't, I don't know, we, okay. we haven't had a little signal yet, um, is that those two pictures at the bottom, that, that's only 1.5 metres by probably about 2 metres, that space. So there was, I think there was eight young people who managed that space. Obviously you can see that it's weeding, it's got lots of weeds in it, but they turned it into a real productive space and the, the plant there is rainbow chard. If you want a quick win with your children, plant rainbow chard. It's a beautiful looking plant, but it also tastes really nice. Um, and they, in, what they did in terms of confidence is that they ate something that they wouldn't normally eat as well. And they were really going for it. Raw rainbow chard is lovely, I have to say. Okay, so the evaluation tools, I'm going to skip over this fairly quickly, but we did the strengths and difficulties questionnaires, um, that is uh, a tool uh, um, I assume that you'll be familiar with, but it's routinely used by CAMS as well as by schools. Um, we had difficulties obtaining post-intervention scores, uh, much harder than getting the uh, beginning intervention scores. Uh, we were collecting these in July, so that may well have been one of the problems. And also it's been suggested by other uh, practitioners that who, who equally try and uh, obtain these scores from schools that actually when you're nearing the end of an intervention, there's no incentive necessarily for the school to complete them and hand them back because they're not sure that they're going to be getting any future benefit. Um, and you can also see that the second school, the primary one, uh, was inconsistent. So we had a different person complete the pre-intervention schools and the post-intervention schools. So they were not comp comparable across the um, duration of the project. In terms of the wellbeing check cards, these are actually based on the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, um, and they are not validated for the children of the age group that we were using. So we had some reservations about them anyway. The PCT um, saw these as a requirement for the funding and they adapted the tool itself. Um, we had massive problems with this. It doesn't collect enough sort of demographic information for us. Um, it also asks how children have been feeling after the last two weeks. We're lucky if we could capture how they've been feeling after the last 10 minutes. Um, so we kind of gave up a little bit. The scores that we got indicated that there were some benefits, although maybe not in the second primary. It, was, it just didn't feel like it was collecting information that was that valuable. I'm not sure how many people would be familiar with the Mental Wellbeing Impact Assessment, but this is... Um, a toolkit that's actually designed for adults that we adapted for children and young people into a two-hour workshop. It, in, it encompasses a number of exercises, including defining well-being, as well as uh, placing factors on a chart like this. Um, and the idea is the green ones represent pre-intervention, and the blue ones represent post-intervention. The workshop was conducted with uh, myself, uh, Carl, uh, and other people delivering the intervention. Um, we did the defining well-being exercise as a full group um, and then we moved on to do these smaller exercises in, in small groups uh, and then fed these back to the whole group to make sure that everybody agreed with where things had been placed. Now we had some uh, methodological difficulties with them, the language is quite adult focused, the, the concepts themselves, you know, the idea of the ability to understand, think clearly and function socially. That's not something that necessarily young people are going to grasp immediately. But rather than us defining and explaining what they meant for us, the young people did that themselves. So we said to them, well, what, what does that mean to you? And took notes around it. So we started to explore what their conceptions of um, emotional well-being perhaps are in relation to uh, these factors. And I suppose a very quick thing to conclude on this slide is that the tool itself was useful when we looked at it in the context of the wider data that we were collecting from other measurement tools. And a lot of what came out of it concurred completely with the experiences of the therapists within the groups. 
The draw and write uh, methodology, uh, as I've mentioned, is participatory methodology. These are some examples from journals uh, that we that we got. Um, we analysed them by colour photocopying them, and we had a pro forma that uh, directed the analysis that explored the use of colour, the percentage of each page for writing, drawing, photos, and then also thematically categorised the, um, the content. And then we did a little quality check to make sure that all of us, the three researchers that had had done the initial check actually had all interpreted these different elements of the pro forma consistently. So as you can see, there was, uh, from one school in particular, that, again, picking up on the themes that Carl has mentioned, there were things around group, group dynamics. This BFF, best friends forever, was a big thing in the primary school group. Um, we also had emotions, so quotes, things like, uh, it was the best day ever, I love gardening, I could do this every day. Uh, and then there was also towards the end of the group, there was sort of mourning the end of the group, sort of I'm going to miss everybody. And then there was activities and achievements uh, um, in the garden space. You can see they've put photos of the actual garden themselves. This is a secondary school and what they have done, uh, so, as well as uh, some comments on future hopes and this is what we could do for the future. Um, there was one in particular that says uh, plants are important. They look good and help us feel relaxed. So the journals themselves uh, gave us an insight into what was going on, perhaps, what, what the key themes were that were being addressed within this space. Um, and we also, it's obviously well integrated into the sessions, and we had teachers comment on the fact, that, particularly from the primary school, that the young people were coming in and collecting their journals and engaging with it outside of the sessions. And these are children who do not normally engage in these sorts of activities, so they could see benefits for their literacy as a way in. Um, the link teacher interviews that we had, so these are the teachers that um, were our contact point in the, in the schools. We asked them for their understanding of social and therapeutic horticulture, as well as the well-being benefits that they deserve, observed and their views on how the intervention delivery could be improved. So this one here is the definition that a teacher came up with in terms of uh, so social and therapeutic horticulture. Um, the one in the middle is uh, sort of nurturing and, and natural environment metaphors. At the top, we've got this idea of um, learning social and team working skills. And on the right, there is uh, freedom that was mentioned quite a lot as a benefit, both by the young people as well as by the teachers. So in particular, the sort of definitions coalesce around the idea that um, this intervention delivered benefits that other therapeutic interventions and things like circle time that they routinely have in schools were not achieving. Um, and the one who actually mentioned the circle time, he started to explore the use of this himself. So when a child had uh, been disruptive in the classroom, he would take the child out into the garden space to water the plants. And in this environment would then start talking to him about what had happened, about the conflict that had happened within the classroom. And saw this as a very accessible uh, tool for, for use within schools much more widely. I haven't really got time to go into this in detail, but this is uh, the, the sort of background theory. Um, green Space Scotland in particular believes that the evidence is most compelling around the restorative effects of green space and near nature the, um, experiences. Biophilia is um, an innate tendency to focus upon life and lifelike processes. The two the most important for us were attention restoration and stress reduction. So attention restoration says that nature assists with recovery from attention fatigue, allowing individuals to distance themselves from routine activities and thoughts to engage without conscious effort. Um, and stress, stress reduction theory uh, states that through psychoevolutionary processes, particular environments produce certain effects with perceptions of safe environments triggering positive emotional responses. Um, I like, I'm quite interested by this idea at the bottom of nature deficit disorder, which is the in increasing distance between children and nature. And actually, we delivered this intervention in a very deprived ward of Liverpool. Mm. And, uh, you know, as Carl has said, the experience of trying new things, mm. they hadn't come across a lot of the fruits and vegetables and things that were being suggested. Um, I don't know if you want to talk very quickly about it being school-based. Um, I mean, I, I think in terms of, of a mental health provision, obviously I'm attached to CAMS. I'm a, I'm a big fan of mental health services being based in schools. I think it's the place for us to be rather than being separate from schools. Um, and that actually um, 
working in partnership in schools helps you identify those children who who are struggling you should get to know about quicker and easier um, those people who are not in school who also might be struggling you'll get to know about them so I think it seems to me it make, it's not rocket science it seems really sensible that actually mental health professionals across the board in terms of camps should be plonking themselves inside schools I've, been, I've advocated this for the last 10 years but um, I keep banging my head against a brick wall I think but um, I think that that's, it's the best place for us to be because we can educate uh, the teachers around group dynamics, me low level mental health problems, etc., um, and also deal with the more, more difficult uh, um, and serious problems as well. Um, and in terms of green space, well, actually, there's, surprisingly, there's loads of it in Liverpool. Uh, it's just a matter of looking. Um, it's there. In fact, I've just walked down here today from. Uh, up the top of town and uh, there's loads of stuff loads of trees and green stuff and it's you know it makes you feel good just even just to look at it um, and i think for the children sometimes they don't see it they see the railings around the school <coughs> they, 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 and they look like prisons to me i think uh, it's horrendous they look like prisons the schools now they don't look like places that are very welcoming um, but there are pockets of green spaces even inside these little prison spaces. <laughs> um, and just lastly then, so we've, we've mentioned that the, the lessons from this evaluation have, have been learnt from and implemented. Um, and we uh, are currently delivering another intervention in two schools. Um, it, there's the focus upon one common issue of loss, smaller groups with less therapists. And these were all recommendations that came out of the evaluation. Um, as well as having a more regular intervention. Uh, the three evaluation tools that we've kind of gone through, we've, we've stuck with the SDQs um, because they suit the schools. Uh, we've stuck with the draw and write journals because they were appreciated by the young people. We actually gave them back to the young people as well at the end of the intervention in an award ceremony, um, which gave them something to keep a memento of the group. Um, and the reflective session diary, as we've mentioned. And we're still, still learning, still kind of uh, looking to keep learning from all of these evaluation tools and the challenges that we had, um, and aiming to develop a, a guide for teachers and community-based professionals um, to help them to set up these sorts of interventions in their schools. And that's us. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was um, was very interesting. It kind of um, links nicely from the first presentation around the need for empowerment, and then thinking about participant-driven research, which brings us into the um, <coughs> third um, presentation now, which is um, around research and development. And Joe Pendleton is going to deliver that. Thank you. Um, everyone's done a lot of listening already, um, so I hope you know you can bear with me for um, this presentation. Um, my name is Jill Pendleton, and I work for um, Mersey Care, and um, I'm the dementia lead for ooh, bit of a whistle there, um, dementia lead for Liverpool Clinical Business Unit um, in Mersey Care, but also the project manager for a project called Innovate Dementia that Graham mentioned earlier, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, it's very t topical, this is Dementia Awareness Week, um, and in Liverpool 2013 is the year of dementia. Um, and just to say that if anybody wants any dementia training for their organisations, um, there's a partnership of um, loads of different partners in Liverpool that have come together um, to try and raise awareness and increase understanding and reduce stigma um, that's attached to um, dementia still. Um, so if anybody wants to speak to Paul White um, or myself afterwards, um, we can link you in. So that's, that's free training and it's part of making dementia, uh, making Liverpool a dementia friendly and dementia aware city. Um, okay. So
so. Um, the, the project that we're involved with, Innovate Dementia, is a trans-European uh, project funded for three years by Interreg, with Interreg funding, and it is to look at innovation um, and the bringing together of health and social care, business, um, academia, and people, the expertise of people living with dementia to try and address some of the challenges, I guess, um, that our society faces around dementia. We've heard, of it, heard it positioned by the media as a time bomb, a tidal wave. Um, I guess, you know, we're all living longer. We're going to see more and more people living with dementia. Um, but I guess one of the central, uh, the kind of central point of the project is actually that we're working with people with dementia who are walking that journey and um, looking at the world through their eyes really to help drive innovation. So um, today we just want to look at um, the kind of underpinning principles of this, of the approach that the project's taking, so looking at open systems, um, the benefits of an inclusive framework that focuses on user-driven innovation and looking at how technology um, can solve some of the issues that people living with dementia face every day. Um, and the, the approach that the project's taken is, is using a living lab approach. Now, um, we have partners in uh, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany for this project. And the first six months of it, I spent trying to understand the jargon and language that's um, involved. So there's a lot of words coming up here um, that I'm just not going to go through. I'm just hopefully going to explain it in, in, in a way that everybody can understand. Um, but there is a lot of jargon that's attached to the project. Um, I guess, you know, if we're cynical, or we need to do something about the way that we are supporting um, people that live with dementia, because in terms of the economy, it's unsustainable. What we tend to do is provide a little bit of support, let people kind of carry on, and then a, a, a point comes where, you know, it's a tipping point and actually there's this inevitability that people think well I can live at home for so long and then I'm going to have to go into care homes and when you're talking to people with dementia that is their biggest fear they want to stay at home like everybody else does and the way that our services are set up they're not um, sustaining or not um, kind of working towards enabling people to stay at home for longer and that's definitely one of the drivers of the project. So how can we target things differently to support people to stay independent uh, for longer, really? Alongside, I mean, running alongside of this is all um, the work that's going on around psychosocial interventions and um, trying to reduce the kind of dominance of the medical model in dementia um, care and the over-reliance on medication uh, and look at alternative approaches um, so looking at kind of moving away from traditional methods of managing um, people to actually enabling people to live independent lives and have a higher level of well-being throughout their dementia journey. Okay, uh, okay so we are looking at um, across Northwest Europe using innovation, working with people with dementia to think about how can we do things differently. Um, and what we want to do is think about how bringing together health and social care, people living with dementia, um, academia and business, um, how bringing those four parts together can enable innovation to develop. Okay. So that's, we, we, had, we had a triple helix approach. Um, which was academia, health and social care and business and the kind of innovation bit actually happens in the middle where all those, all those groups are brought together but actually what we wanted was a quadruple helix so actually that people with dementia have a central um, part in our project and one of the things that we've learnt is actually what happens is companies and really clever people go away and develop things and then they take them to people with dementia and then they find that they're not quite doing what they should be doing because actually they're developed 
by people that aren't experiencing those problems. So what we are um, trying to do within the project is co-create and so um, we're hearing about um, what it's like um, to live with, with dementia and think about what kind of things actually would make a difference. And we're going to show a DVD later of, of kind of some of the, the workshops that have um, that we've that we've run. Okay. The project uses a living lab approach, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But there are four main themes for our project, and these were givens. Um, so initially, when I first saw it, I kind of thought lighting was was odd. But uh, the more I understand about lighting, the more that I see that that has a, a role to play. So there are four main themes for our project. The first one is looking at intelligent lighting. So looking at how lighting can improve um, people's rest-wake cycle and looking at actually does it have an impact on mood. There are certain um, times of the, the day for people with dementia, particularly who are living in kind of a group setting where, you know, type people have higher levels of distress. Um, and so we're looking at actually, will lighting have any impact on that? And, and I guess not in isolation, um, that's an important thing to remember. So one of the themes for the project is to look at lighting. Second theme is to look at exercise and nutrition. And in terms of primary prevention, the evidence around um, nutrition and exercise is really quite compelling. <laughs> um, we all need to be doing things right down here to look at our lifestyles in terms of preventing um, dementia and um, so one of the areas where, that we're um, doing is, is working with children in schools actually um, to try and get dementia into, into people's heads uh, before, uh, before we need to start thinking about it. Another area that we're looking at is living environments and so things that in your environment would enable you to function more independently. And uh, taking Emad's point about us becoming very risk averse, particularly in the area of dementia, we want to keep people very safe, but actually sometimes we're harming people in a different way because we're taking everything away from them to ensure their safety. But actually um, there's an element of enabling and empowering people and, and that's an important, really important element. So we're thinking about people's living environments and what can we do in the environment that would enable you to have a good quality of life and to remain at home for longer. And the other big area of work is models of assistance, uh, models of access um, to assistance. So understanding the system and how you get into it, understanding the tipping points, the things that bring people to the point of thinking, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, so one of the big pieces of work that we're doing at the moment is, is mapping services, but also looking at people's experiences and looking what those things are, what are those common things that actually if we, if we um, align services differently, we could target our resources differently to enable people um, to live well with dementia. Okay. And the third element of the project is, is working with small businesses and, and generating business. Okay. Our, our first output, the first major output was to um, establish a baseline report, um, so around those key areas looking at what the evidence says so far and so that's um, written up now and I guess, um, you know, the common themes that came out of that was actually we're a bit behind the times and we need to be thinking about the future and certainly when I first started working on this project, I was kind of thinking, oh, technology, people with dementia, you know, is that, is that going to um, be something that people will be uh, able to engage with? But one of the things is that I've been very surprised by the way that people with dementia have responded to some of the gadgets and uh, easy to use kind of interfaces that, that we have been using. But the other thing is that actually we're designing for generations in the future who will be very uh, familiar with iPhones, iPads and, and that kind of technology, tablet technology. Okay. I'm going to move on because I think probably the most valuable thing is the DVD, so I just want to, um, to move on uh, to allow time for that. We're using a living lab approach. I'll let you, <laughs> let you read that definition and see if you understand it afterwards. 
Um, but there's a simpler, user, more user-friendly definition of a living lab, which is a pragmatic research environment which openly engages all relevant partners with an emphasis on improving the real-life care of people living with dementia through the use of sustainable innovation. And basically, living labs are where people are. So we're using a ward uh, as a living lab. We're using people's homes as living labs. We're kind of um, getting people to develop and then test out technologies where they actually are. Okay. That's... Um, some of the principles around a living uh, lab approach which are shared by all the partners throughout the project so that you know we need to think about continuity it needs to be open it needs to be real it needs to empower service users and it needs to be spontaneous and I suppose one of the things that I'm most um, proud of if, if I should be is um, the involvement of people with dementia in the project which um, you know a, a lot of um, times in mental health services we have a token carer and working groups and things but actually this is really about engaging uh, in a very real way with uh, with people with dementia okay so these are kind of uh, things around the dementia strategy that we're aiming to do so look at health promotion assessment and early diagnosis and then living well with dementia <coughs> and um, these are some of our kind of the work that we're doing at the moment. So Acorn Ward is a ward in Mossley Hill Hospital and we're going to be um, using the intelligent lighting in that ward and looking at uh, the role of exercise there. So we've done some um, baseline measures uh, and then we are going um, currently um, looking at installing the lights and then looking at, at um, using those measures again. So because the population is going to change, we took a snapshot of kind of characteristics of a cohort before we then install the lights and then can compare um, like we can't compare exactly the same group of people but we can uh, compare a cohort with the same characteristics we're doing some work with care homes around using exercise um, and um, we are also developing products with people with dementia and one of the kind of areas that we're looking at is using near field technology um, as a way of prompting people um, and so looking at um, developing software around that so that actually if you want to be able to um, make a meal but you can't remember the sequence of that um, you'll be able to do that if you want to work your washing machine you can put a sticker on your washing machine and uh, you know the instructions for using your washing machine uh, will come up so we're thinking more than prompting because there's a lot of gadgets and things out there that prompt but we are hoping that actually there's an element of enabling um, people to maintain independent for longer we're working with schools to look at kind of nutrition and exercise and we're also looking at um, hearing people's stories at the moment so looking at service user journeys to map out those kind of critical points around um, tipping people into other services. We're working with the Alzheimer's Society to do some evaluations and actually it's just snowballing as more and more people hear about the project we're kind of getting involved in lots and lots of different things really. There's an experience room at John Moore's uh, over the road which has got the intelligent lighting installed so um, you can kind of experience what's, what that's like and that's going to be used as a place where people with dementia can go in and um, experience that and, and use some of the, the technologies that are being developed. Okay, so there's some of the different areas that we're working on at the moment. Um, I need to go back, excuse me. The, the way that we've worked is that we've worked with the Open Labs department in Liverpool John Moores and um, we have um, worked with people with dementia and thought about their day and then we've brought businesses in because actually what we found out is there's a lot of technology out there but it hasn't been applied to this area. Um, so I'm going to show you the DVD now which will give you hopefully a, a, a wider understanding of what the project does. <coughs> There are currently 800,000 people with dementia in the UK and the figures are set to double in the next 40 years. With 60% of all care being given by informal family carers, they save the UK alone 
over £8 billion a year. The Innovate Dementia Project is made up of partners from across Northwest Europe, all aiming to promote innovative care for persons with dementia and boost employment within their communities. Innovate Dementia UK have, as their name suggests, begun to develop innovative and sustainable solutions for individuals with dementia and their carers, exploring the theme, what would make your day easier? I think one of the things that I, I, I think is, is key to this project is really getting the message across that this is about, or should be driven by people, who are living with dementia. That is, when we talk about that term, that was a term that um, was mentioned in the first RSP, that um, carers and people diagnosed with dementia were saying that it's living with dementia, the part of a partnership of living together. So we kind of need to use a word that's inclusive. And one of the key things the message is trying to get across is that those individuals should drive the project. We went to the um, meeting where there were several people, different people there, showing different um, things that could help with Alzheimer's. Um, there was a tablet um, thing that you could use, um, a camera, um, something to show you how you could make a cup of tea safely. Uh, what else was there like? The, the thing that uh, I asked for to remind me of, to but, take my tablets. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> yes, that, that was quite complicated though, I thought. Oh, did you? Yeah. I haven't took uh, them since. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second RSP was about looking at the challenges of everyday life living with dementia, and what are those challenges, and people talked about um, <clears throat> challenges from getting up in the morning, to going to bed at night time. They talked about things like remembering to do things. They talked about um, safety um, and their, their own feelings about what their, what their day is. During that um, second um, partnership meeting, we also had started to encourage businesses to be there as well, to explore, not necessarily solutions, but to think about how we can assist people. And some of the issues that, that, that came up was that some of the things that people may benefit from are out there but they may not know about them and maybe there's something around how we capture that um, and also then thinking about that some of those things may need to be adapted that there are different technologies that are available but they also need to be changed as well and they need to be changed in a way that the population of people living with dementia um, impacts upon that product development because at the moment they're not integral to that, that process. Open Labs is a European funded project. We're based at John Moores University. We're there to essentially do research and innovation to work with our academic colleagues and get them working together with technology companies in the Northwest. We work with small technology companies and many of them are looking for new emerging opportunities. So we work with our academic colleagues who have those opportunities but don't necessarily have the partnerships with the small companies. So we bring them together through platforms like the regional stakeholders meetings and look for opportunities for them to develop new products and services. But bear in mind that this project is across Northwest Europe, so we have eight partners um, and our partnership is within the UK um, and that's Merseycare NHS Trust and Liverpool John Moores and then we have partners across um, in the Netherlands Belgium and Germany. So they're facing similar challenges, they're using similar approaches and we're also then starting to compare data and that's why we're having what we call a baseline report at the end of the year which will be about <clears throat> understanding what some of those challenges are and possibly what some of those solutions are. One of the ideas that you had was maybe using an iPad or a tablet to remind you how to do to do things. Oh they are smashing. You know, they're a bit pricey, but it's well worthwhile. I mean, if it's going to help anybody in the same, same circumstances as us all that's here, then by all means, you know. Well, it, with, with a gadget like that, I mean, if you, it's in the living room or kitchen, you can, hang the, you can pin it on the wall, 
you put all your dates in, um, occasions, to, to, you know, engagement, weddings and things like that. And the thing is, you can use it as a diary, basically, instead of writing it all in. You know, I mean, there's really, there's lots of things you could think about. But um, they are, they are smashing to use, you know. Just having Alzheimer's and things like that and dementia, it's bad enough to, you know, just knowing that you've got that. And in my circumstances, and a lot of the ones in there as well, I think to myself, half of them are in the same, we're all in the same boat together. And, I mean, it would, it would definitely help, you know. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like anything else. It's a toy at first. But in the, at the end result is, it's a damn good one that's going to help you. Why do you think it's important that you're involved in the project? Uh, I think it's good that you are involved, certainly the Alzheimer's themselves, because they really know what it's like, don't they, <clears throat> to deal with it. M me personally, I... I... I get too many things going on. I'm doing too many things at once, and then I, I stop, and I, you've got to think, and you've got to think, you know, what was I doing five minutes ago? And they're the things, that, that's the worst thing, because you're halfway of doing something and you're thinking to yourself, no, I've, I've put something down somewhere, that's the worst thing ever. Well, for me personally, you know, I, that's, that's, that's me, but uh, other than that, you know, it, it can be used for a lot of different things. You know, and it's, it's well worthwhile. Yeah. Instead of uh, hiding it, you know, how can I put this? Instead of hiding the feelings, I think with this group, it allows you to come out and say what, what's wrong with you. And that encourages other people to talk more about what's wrong with them. So uh, I think it's been very, very helpful. I think everything that's been uh, happening has been oh, it's, for the it's best. certainly very good. And I mean, I think the next meeting at the Crown Plaza will carry on from there, won't yeah. it?